Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Power State, the first episode of season four of Power State. This is our fourth semester running this show. My name is Matthew Ogden. I'm Matt Pellizzi. I am Sam Brungo. We got we we got a nice little season uh, season opener for you guys. You know, a lot of nice catch up mostly. This, this is like a catch up episode to kind of, you know, catch people up on stuff they might have missed during the break and everything. We're bringing on associate editor Owen Abbey to uh, catch us up on everything that's happened with Penn State Hoops. After that, we're going to be joined by fellow editor Ryan Parsons to sort of have a nice little coda to the football season, sort of look to uh, the off season, everything that's happened with draft, um, potential prospects, where they might go, what people are talking about, uh, and also transfers as well, players who are leaving and players who might, uh, might come here. So we're going to be diving into that. All right, and uh, without further ado, let us welcome on Owen Abbey to talk Penn State hoops. Owen, thank you so much for joining us, man. How was your break? Have a nice, uh, some nice holidays. Yeah, I mean, it was it was nice taking time, not having to worry about school, but I, I'm ready to get back in the swing of things. And here's hoping that this semester is a little bit better than the last. I feel you, man. And I mean, what a better thing to jump right into after a nice break than Penn State men's basketball. Absolutely. Penn State basketball themselves are uh, coming back from a break of sorts because of a few members of the team tested positive for the uh, COVID-19 virus. And because of that, they haven't played a basketball game since uh, since last year, since uh, December 30th, I believe. So, uh, Owen, talk about um, what this uh, what this team has been through these past few weeks and, uh, you know, the time they've missed. Penn State has had, I believe, three games postponed due to this outbreak within the program. That three, those three games spans over multiple weeks. It's a lot of time to not be playing basketball. So coming out of this break, the team has a lot that they need to work through. Uh, you, they're in a bit of a slump as a three game losing streak in conference play. They're playing in the best conference in America. There is no easy game uh, on their schedule. So the fact that they have to now catch up in a way, you know, make up for lost practice time and then play four games in the span of a week. That's, that's a lot for, any team really, but it will be a lot for this Penn State team, which is already undersized and undermanned. Yeah, Owen, Penn State has so far in their first uh, handful of games have kind of fallen behind um, what we were expecting coming into the season before obviously some changes going on, going just three and four, oh and three in the Big Ten. So what can you tell us about uh, the difference between what expectations were and how much that had to do with the coaching changes from uh, Patrick Chambers to Jim Ferry or uh, player changes with the losses of Lamar Stevens and Mike Watkins. What's uh, what's the difference between the squad and last year's? I think this year uh, they don't have their, their star playmaker. Like Lamar Stevens was the man. And you can bet that Lamar Stevens was going to put up double digits every night, be a force in the paint, be someone that the opposing team has to guard against. And then that lets Miles Dredd or Myron Jones or Isaiah Brockington pop off and really play well. And now you have this team that doesn't have that key player. In the beginning of the season, it looked like it could have been Seth Lundy, but then Seth Lundy didn't play well in these first few games of the Big Ten. Um, I think Isaiah Brockington has stepped into that role, and I think Isaiah Brockington has played really well uh, for the team of late, but there's no guy who puts fear in their opponent. And with that, it allows teams to just play a little more aggressive, play a little tougher on defense. And, you know, they, if they can stop Seth Lundy or Isaiah Brockton from torching the net, then they are going to be in good shape against Penn State because there, no one on that team is a guarantee bucket. For sure. And, like, you know, they started the season off 3-1, and one, uh, getting wins against VMI, VCU, and Virginia Tech, uh, three V teams. And, you know, during these wins, it looked like that um, their strategy of kind of basically rotating, uh, you know, game in, game out, who's going to be, you know, quote-unquote, the guy each game and, like, letting the, essentially letting the offense run through one guy while the other players on the team kind of, have like a, have like a role playing type of position um, 
for a while it looked like that this strategy was actually going to uh work but then uh but then big Ten play came around and uh penn state just hasn't has not been able to uh compete with such a a dense uh conference yeah big 10 play is is a different beast you gotta give credit to penn state for handling virginia tech in the way they did that was a really good win for the Cincinnati Lions program. But that was probably the best shooting that I have seen this team do in my two years watching Penn State basketball. And that can't, that won't, just won't happen every night. So they have, they had to be a little more consistent than they have been in the past and they just aren't. And then you look on the defensive side, the defensive side's an issue too. And, you know, you look at these first three games, they've, been manhandled in the paint and that's due to John Hara being physical but picking up fouls and Trent Buttrick and Abdus Sambila just being bad matchups against the big men in this conference and that unfortunately is going to be a trend for these next few games it's it's, it's going to be hard for Penn State to win if they can't at least limit points in the paint compared to how they've been in the past. And Owen, you mentioned these next few games. I mean, just the next two that are coming up. First, their first game back from their from their hiatus uh, on January seventeenth. Uh, that's going to be away, actually. Which you know, just your first game away after such a long break has just got to be so tough. You know, it's not like you have a chance to get used to playing basketball again in your home arena, where you know things are more familiar. No, you have to travel and go somewhere else. We haven't, you know, you haven't played a team in forever. You need to basically remember how to play as a team. Uh, you know, and that's Purdue, which is normally always a solid team. But then, of course, it doesn't get easier. They're on the road again for their next game against, uh, you know, a ranked uh, Illinois team, which granted, they did kind of, you know, give it to Illinois a tiny bit, but then they let that game go away. They lost Illinois earlier in the season, 98-81. So just those two games coming up, what can we expect from those two squads? And, you know, what does Penn State have to do to try to salvage something out of this tough opening road trip? Well, Purdue first is one of these teams that is always a good team. They're always, they're well coached and they're always going to play hard and do well. The problem with Purdue, like Illinois in the next game and Michigan, who they've previously played, is that Illinois' best players are their big men. Their leading scorer is a 6'10 forward, um, and they also have a 7'4 freshman. And that is going to be a huge matchup problem for John Hara and Trent Buttrick and Abdul Sambila. So I would expect that Purdue is going to play very much in the paint um, and maybe try to force Penn State to focus all their attention on the paint and then Penn, and then that will allow Purdue to possibly kick it out for threes and jumpers. I think if Penn State's going to win that game, they have to play – like they did down the stretch against Indiana and down the stretch against Michigan, where they are making shots. You know, Myron Jones was really good against Indiana. He didn't make a lot of shots. So Myron Jones has to be hot. Isaiah Brockington has to be hot. And they can't turn the ball over. Turnovers have been killer uh, for this team and foul trouble as well. Turnovers and foul trouble, if you can limit those against a team like Purdue, that's, that's a game that Penn State can win. Illinois is a little different because they they played each other before, and I think Illinois is going to be better prepared in that their first half of the next game. They came out really sluggish against Penn State the first time they played, um, which allowed Penn State to stay with them, but they'll be feeding Kofi Coburn a lot more uh, now that they know that Coburn can obliterate whoever Penn State puts in front of them, him. So, I mean... Illinois is a tough game. I don't necessarily expect that game to fall for Penn State, but Purdue is a game where, you know, they'll probably be rusty in that first half. It, that's just what happens when you don't play basketball for several weeks. If they can make the shots, keep themselves close, as we saw against Indiana, like that all you need is to stay close in a game and make some key shots and make some key stops and you're right and back in it. Uh, Penn State interim head coach Jim Ferry had a very uh, optimistic perspective on um, Penn State basketball's little break. He said uh, in a press conference, he said, my message to these guys is that we are the most well-rested team in the Big Ten right now. 
which is a, it's a very glass half full kind of um, outlook on what they've been through. But at the same time, like how much, how much practice time has this team been getting, um, you know, during, during this time off but away from basketball, really? So they've had all week to practice as a team. And I also think that probably players who know they weren't positive were probably doing shots on their own. I don't know for sure, but I'm sure that, you know, there's that drive in players that they want to get better themselves. So they're going to do it individually if they can't do it as a team. So I think that this team has, I think it's an optimistic outlook for sure, but it's also not entirely false. They're, they are the most well-rested team in the Big Ten. They also don't have injuries. Now, this gives them time to heal. And if they have people that might be battling through some soreness or some injuries, um, this was it's a very opportune time for that. So um, it hurts that they don't have that they only have a week of practice going into this game, and you know they haven't played another team besides themselves since December. But it is what it is. You deal with the circumstances, and you, you hope for the best. Um, Owen, thank you so much for coming on and talking basketball. We'll be looking forward to chatting with you in the future here. All right, thanks for having me. All right, guys, thank you so much again to Owen for talking hoops with us. Now we are joined by another editor on our site, Mr. Ryan Parsons. We're going to be doing a nice little coda, I'd say, a nice little epilogue to the Penn State football season. But first off, Ryan, how are you doing, my man? How was your break? I'm doing fantastic, Matt. How about you? Um, I'm doing fantastic as well. But yeah, so getting into uh, getting into football. First, before we dive into some of the more recent offseason stuff, Ryan, do you just want to give us your very brief thoughts on how Penn State ended the season? Obviously, you know, already, you know, an infamous start um, that kind of shocked every fan of Penn State football, um, you know, starting out the season 0-5, uh, um, just absolutely brutal. Um, but it seems like they bounced back. But, I mean, what, what were your thoughts on how things closed out? Yeah, so, like, after the first, I want to say the two games, when the season was basically over in terms of uh, winning the Big Ten or making it to the playoffs, it was kind of like, where do we go from here? And they just kept losing. Like, it made it down to 0-5, the worst start in program history. And again, it was, where do we go from here? And they just won out. Like, that's all you can do is just just try to win the games in front of you. Um, it's all, like, a lot a lot of good things in the final four games. Um, from freshmen like Kazea Holmes and Parker Washington just going off, really, to Sean Clifford showing signs of moving back towards what he was in 2019. Um, there was a lot of good takeaways from a team that was really just down and out at 0-5. Could have easily folded. Guys could have opted out. Guys could have gone to parties and caught COVID. No one got sick the whole season, which was I, I took away as a really big victory. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all things considered, starting at 0-5, I thought they uh, finished out the season very well. Yeah, Ryan, you, you, you did write a really uh, great article about um... – Given given the uh, Penn State football team props at the end of the year for what was it they had they had less they had less cases than any other team in the Big Ten and they were the one of only two Big Ten teams to have to uh, one of only two Big Ten teams that didn't cancel a game this year so yeah it was only them and Rutgers that um, played their full schedule uninhibited because of COVID um, we don't know for sure no one tested positive I mean they never shut anything down um, the results that they give us is just from Penn State athletics as a whole. So it could just be someone on like the track and field team. It could be someone on the basketball team. We don't really know for sure, but um, no one notable ever any ever missed games or anything. So it looked like it was a big success from the virus standpoint. Yeah. So Ryan, talk a little bit about uh, Penn State's decision to ultimately uh, skip appearing in a bowl game. Uh, this was kind of a divisive topic, I guess. But um, at the end of the day, the decision boiled down to uh, Penn State coaches and players a um, spending time with their families during the holiday season and, you know, getting to have a semi-normal Christmas, all things considered, and then B, uh, suiting up and playing in the uh, Duke's Mayo Bowl. So, like, tell us about um, how they uh, weighed those two options and uh, came out with their final decision. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure everyone wanted the Penn State to go play in that Duke's Mayo Bowl, um, finish 500, 5-5. Five and five. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just it's just the team's decision. Um, People as fans or media members might have wanted to cover or watch one more game, but it's really just a decision of the student athletes and the coaches to make. Um, they came to the decision very quickly, fairly quickly. So I think just after that long season of being in a bubble, not being able to see family, 
and with Christmas right around the corner, everyone just decided let's just let's just call it off and, and regroup next year, which I think was the right decision to make. Um, being crowned Duke's Mayo Bowl champion, as as much as that might be uh, great on Twitter for for a couple of days, I mean, I don't know if that really is worth um, putting yourself in danger and and skipping a holiday season after already not being with family or friends for such a, a long time beforehand. While Penn State had a kind of an interesting season this year, uh, some, including myself, uh, would consider it to be have been a fake season that didn't count. Um, I would have probably thought differently if we went, you know, 9-0, and but we did see some things. One of the things that we saw was a uh, new first-year offensive coordinator, Kirk Soraka, come out and kind of struggle offensively. Some games he would have the run game going, some games he would have the passing game going. Rarely would he have both going at the same time. And obviously there's a lot of slack that we can give for a first year offensive coordinator, especially in college with the new um, new system and everything. But obviously we just heard a couple weeks ago that uh, Penn State is making a change from Kirk Soraka to Mike Yersich from Texas. So what can you say about that? And how does that change the outcome of Penn State's future uh, this year and in the upcoming seasons? I mean, it was it was surprising. I When I woke up and saw that news, it was just like, whoa. Like, I don't think anyone really saw uh, Saratica being fired coming. Um, I mean, of course, they didn't really perform that well, but with, with COVID and the short and training camp and all those things, you know, you don't really expect that to happen. But but Yursich is a great hire. Um, he was a quarterbacks coach at um, Ohio State. He was at Texas. He's been a coach for over uh, more than 20 years now. Um, so there's a lot of things to be excited about moving forward. Um, Sean Clifford with another year under his belt. Guys like Noah Kane coming back. Um, guys like Keziah Holmes and Parker Washington improving. Um, the offense could really be dangerous next year if things start to click. Um, so I'm excited about having your sitch in Happy Valley. And I think that it doesn't really reflect on Kirk Soraka and his year that he had. And I don't think that it should come that da- boil down to him uh, having a bad year and not being able to get the job done rather than just the availability of Mike Yersich with the firing of Herman over in Texas, because that really was what brought him from Ohio State to Texas. So I think that had he been more available, we would have seen him as offensive coordinator this year. But I think it all boils down to his availability and that he was a better option rather than that Kirk was a bad coach for our team. I don't think this season ended and then and- James Franklin was like, okay, I need to go fire uh, Kirk now. I think it was they saw Yursich was available. Um, he played football in Pennsylvania, so he knows, like, the the vibe. He knows about recruiting in Pennsylvania. And, he, and yeah, like we, what you said, if he was available last year, I think he was he's the guy over Soraka. Nothing against Soraka. He, he did great things at Minnesota, especially in um, 2019. Was really poised to do great things last year with Penn State, but obviously for whatever circumstances, injuries, COVID, things didn't really work out. Um, so it might have been more of a right guy, wrong time sort of situation. But um, I think your stitch is, is a better fit for Penn State. Yeah, like, I just think this move shows that uh, Franklin isn't really wasting time at, um, you know, putting this last season behind him and behind the program as a whole. And uh, he's really ensuring that 2021 won't be a repeat of 2020. I guess I guess Sriracha could be, I guess, used as a scapegoat here because like I guess he was a celebrated addition last season. And the offense seemingly fell flat in most games. So I kind of just think it's a good thing that Franklin isn't really getting complacent, isn't afraid to make a uh, risky coaching change that he thinks will uh, benefit this team in the long run. And like you said, uh, Yersich is an excellent hire. Um, you know, tell us about um, tell us about his time at Oklahoma State and Ohio State, where he uh, like I think he's ranked he ranks he's ranked first among all offensive coordinators since 2013 in uh, like average yards per play and other some other wonky statistics. Yeah, so in, in his career as an FBS coach, um, Yursich has averaged uh, 6.49 yards per play, which among all offensive coordinators in college football since 2013, he's number one um, in yards per play, which is really just, I mean, he's a guy that might have been under the radar for some people. Um, but that's just a, a very surprising statistic. And also um, his, his passing game in particular has been very effective. Um, it, he averages 14, almost, just over 14 yards per completion, which is, again, the highest among all Power 5 coordinators um, since 2013. So it's just really a guy to get excited about, really a guy that you hope Sean Clifford can 
um, start clicking again with and, and building with some of the younger players. Yeah, definitely. I mean, those stats you just read off are definitely, you know, I don't know if the viewers could see it on YouTube, but my eyebrows just kind of shot up uh, with each, you know, number one that you were talking about. So definitely good things to look forward to. Hopefully finally find that consistency at the offensive coordinator position. Uh, well, one of the bigger things in the last few years to develop in college football, which is the explosion of the transfer market and the removal of a lot of restrictions. So we're going to jump into that and what Penn State has been active in, uh, in terms of the transfer market. Um, you have some players transferring away. I think CJ Thorpe, Antonio, Sel um, Antonio Shelton are some of the bigger names um, that are leaving the team, but we also have some decent names coming in uh, from a bunch of different schools. So Ryan, do you want to give us just a brief overview on where Penn State stands right now um, in the transfer market? Antonio Shelton was maybe the biggest name that left, but um, I think a lot of people expected him to, to graduate or declare for the draft anyway. So it was really interesting that he decided to um, transfer to Florida on a graduate transfer. But um, coming in, there's really a bunch of guys to get excited about. Um, Johnny Dixon, a defensive back from USC, um, is going to be a great addition to the secondary. That is really strong already um, with three Castro fields coming back. Um, guys like Joey Porter Jr. and Jaquan Brisker, who are just um, really had great years last year. Um, Dixon's going to be a, a great addition to that secondary, which really could be dangerous. Um, and another guy to get excited about is a Temple player, actually, um, Arnold Ebekiti. Um, he's a defensive end. He had uh, 42 tackles, four sacks, and three forced fumbles um, in just six games this season with Temple. Um, he's a player from Maryland that was, um, he was considering Penn State as a recruit, but was never offered. So I think after he had um, some good seasons, a uh, good season at Temple, um, caught the eye of James Franklin. So he's gonna be a good addition um, someone else is uh, John Lovett, uh, another running back from Baylor. Um, Penn State's running back room already is pretty deep, but Lovett's just going to be another good addition. So it'll be him, Noah Kane, Devin Ford, Kazea Holmes, and um, Kevon Lee. It's going to be a pretty deep running back room. Um, he had uh, 6.3 yards per carry at Baylor in 2019, um, and he has over 1,500 career rushing yards. So he's a pretty solid addition to the running back room as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, every addition that Penn State has made has just been a um, something to be excited about, um, really building on to next year and trying to make 2020 just an anomaly. Yeah, it's good, I think, to see uh, Penn State finally starting to recruit through the transfer portal, especially with Eva Katie and um, Derek Tangelo from Duke. We're kind of making up for uh, some losses that we're having on the defensive line, including Antonio Shelton, Judge Culpepper, and Jason Owe, and Shock Tony. So we're, we're losing uh, definitely most of our starters. Uh, even though we still have some depth, those guys are coming in to make a pretty nice, um, pretty nice effect on that replacement. So with that, we see also – Players like Lamont Wade, Shaka Tony, Jason Owe, Pat Fryermuth obviously declare for the draft. Um, but some players returning, including Rashid Walker, Jaquan Brisker, like you mentioned, Jahan Dotson, which is huge, and Tariq Castro Field. So what effect does those players come back have on this team, including the ones that are leaving, and how will that affect? Yeah, so I think what, like what you said, the defensive line was probably the biggest hit through transfers and um, draft declarations. I mean, most of... Um, what's happened has been expected so far. Um, Jason Owe and Jahan Dodson were the only guys that I thought were on the bubble. Um, Owe left, Dodson stayed. So the d defensive line definitely was not banged up, but but pretty um, shell-shocked by all these people leaving and transferring. But like you said, Tangelo is, is a great addition to the line. And young guys like Adisa Isaac, who show a lot of promise, hopefully can step up. Um, and you mentioned Jaquan Brisker, another name that is, is really going to be huge to return. Um, he was... Last year, really, every play, he, he was just there. He was all over the field. Um, just watching him, like, it was a very noticeable uh, piece to Penn State's secondary. Um, Tariq Castro Fields, too, he obviously didn't play that much last year due to what James Franklin said were medical reasons, so take that as you will. But um, he had been great in the past in 2019, 2018. So um, a lot of veteran guys, older guys, who have a lot of uh, – Tangelo was a three-year starter, so a lot of – Penn State's bringing back and bringing in older guys who can hopefully help mentor the younger guys like, like Adisa Isaac, um, a Joey Porter Jr. I guess one final thing right now, too, in terms of, um, you know, the NFL draft will be popping up soon. Um, 
what names do you think we should expect uh, to be called for former Penn State players? I know, I mean, you know, Pat Fireman has been talked about as potentially like a first round uh, tight end pick for some teams, but where, where should we be looking uh, for players to land? Uh, Micah, Micah Parsons included as well. Yeah, Micah Parsons definitely look for him to go in, in the top 10. That's pretty much a no brainer. Um, maybe even, even within the, the top seven or eight. Um, I, having a year off, I mean, so, some people might have not forgot about him, but kind of flies under the radar a little bit, but he, he's still up there with the top draft picks. Um, Pat Fryermuth as well, his injury this year, um, it, it kind of makes it hard to, to peg where he's going to fall in this draft. If he went first round, I would not be surprised early second round. Um, and even a guy like Jason Owe, who really didn't, wasn't ex- incredibly productive at Penn State, but just his unique build and just like raw athleticism might have a team take, take a shot on him in the first round, maybe a team or late in the first round that isn't uh, really reliant on the draft pick, but might want to take a shot on a guy who they think that they can build. Um, and then, yeah, the, wait, let me, let me think. Um, and, and a guy like L- Lamont Wade too, who a lot of people maybe weren't expecting to declare for the draft, but um, could definitely s- sneak in there in maybe the mid to later rounds. Um, and of course, Shaka Tony, who um, most people expected to go to the draft, um, really flourished his last two years at Penn State, especially this year, was just all over the ball on the uh, defensive line. I expect him to go um, top top three rounds. Um, I haven't really seen him in many mock drafts just because he just declared recently, but I definitely see him for a second, third round going. Um, another guy who's a really great athlete and had the numbers to show it in college. Wonderful, wonderful. Ryan, thank you uh, so much. Yep, thanks guys for having me on again. Okay, so that was our basketball chat with uh, associate editor Owen Abbey and our football chat with social media manager Ryan Parsons. Well, I just wanted to say first and foremost that, uh, you know, creating this podcast with, uh, Mr. Matthew Paolisi and Mitch, Mr. Mitchell Stewart was uh, probably one of my biggest highlights that I've had since joining Auburn State in fall 2018. I remember when I joined in fall 2018 in my interview, uh, I talked about wanting to start a podcast and uh, um, the managing editor at the time, Elisa, and uh, um, future managing editor, editor Tony were the two that interviewed me and they were like, yeah, we've, we've, had, a, we've had a ton of people say that, but uh, uh, it's, never, uh, it's never actually happened. So, um, yeah, I once again want to thank Matthew Paolisi and Mitchell Stewart for helping me uh, make the first ever Almer State podcast. I appreciate everything you've done for this podcast and everything that you've done for me. So I appreciate you, brother. Oh, absolutely, brother. I I just want to thank you for uh, being one of the first people to, uh, you know, when you're when you're a contrib, no less, like just join staff reach out and be like, Hey, I want to get involved in the pod. You got involved in the pod. You were great on the pod. And uh, yeah, now you're going to be taken over full time. It's going to be, it's going to be exciting. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see what you guys do, the guests you bring on the topics you discuss. Yeah. I'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll be watching, listening and uh, you know, I'll be back. And this has been uh, the season four premiere of Pod Ridge State. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, tuning in and uh, watching us uh, the first three seasons. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. My name is Matthew Ogham. I'm Matt Pellis. I'm Sam Brunga. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week.